about what I think about uh, discipleship in Christian life. Um, the greatest thing that ever happens to anybody is to get saved. In fact, just tonight in our church, we had a 13-year-old boy that trusted Jesus to be his Savior. But uh, for the church, uh, the work has just now begun. Because uh, the Bible teaches that we're not just to make converts, but we're to make disciples, uh, to make learners, to make followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we do that a lot of different ways. We do that by teaching them the Word of God uh, and preaching to them. We do that by praying for them. We do that by um, helping them, mentoring them, uh, helping them along the way. Realizing that they're new babes in Christ Jesus and there's lots of things that they don't know. They don't know what to do. So it is necessary for God's people to take time and to place effort in the lives of converts to help them grow in their walk with the Lord. Now, of course, the goal in making disciples is that God gets glory through their lives. But one of the greatest ways that God gets glory through their lives is for them to grow to the point in their life to where they share their faith with other people and see them come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, you see, Christian life is uh, a life in the Christian church uh, is made up of uh, additions, but then when God's people make disciples, then it becomes multiplication. But we don't just lead people to Christ our Savior, but then we see them grow and see them lead other people to Jesus too. Oh, uh, it is wonderful to see people get saved, but it's also wonderful to see somebody grow in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I want to make an extra effort as a preacher to uh, be a, a disciple maker. And I would encourage every Christian to do the same. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Without prompting, uh, these men of God are sharing uh, many of the same things uh, without without us talking about it. Just saying, hey, shoot me a video on discipleship. And so, praise God, uh, that is what it's about. Is that other souls will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that as they come to know the Lord, them as Lord and Savior, Him as Lord and Savior, then we're able to further uh, invest in their lives and see them do the same. Amen? John chapter 8, verses 28 through 36, as we continue our series on discipleship this morning. And uh, this moment, not exactly like the other moments that we've looked at so far in discipleship, in that Jesus wasn't specifically just talking to his disciples, but he was talking to a group of new converts, uh, as well as some religious folks who had not converted and followed Christ. And so, uh, the need for truth in discipleship is what I've entitled this message. The need for truth in discipleship. John chapter 8, verses 28 through 36. You got your place, say amen. amen. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me, that the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. As He spake these words, now watch what happened. As He spake these words, many believed on Him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, Ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Jesus sets you free. You're free indeed this morning. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should not be sitting in bondage. You ought to know true freedom in Jesus Christ. And listen, the truth makes you free. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we love you. We praise you this morning. We pray you would impart your truth into our lives. Change us, Lord. Mold us where we need to be shaped this morning to be more like Christ. 
And for someone here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Lord, He has been lifted up in this place this morning. And so, Lord God, we pray You would come by the power of Your Holy Spirit and knock at the door of the heart of the lost sinner this morning, that they might be gloriously saved. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we continue in this, this is a very important word. This need for truth in discipleship. I want you. I want to ask you a question. Ponder this for just a moment. Have you ever considered the importance of truth? And you say, well, Brother Jeff, I mean, we, we come to this church because we believe we're, we're preaching the truth, we're teaching the truth, we're, we believe the truth. Okay, that's great. And the truth is important. But I want you to, I want you to understand just how important the truth is. I, I love how Adrian Rogers puts it. And I, I'll plug for Sunday school real quick, Brother David, and say this, that we're studying what every Christian ought to know, and every Christian ought to know what we're studying. And so if you're wondering what we ought to know, you can come be with us on Sunday mornings, and Adrian Rogers wrote a book about it, okay? So I love what Adrian Rogers says about the truth, though. He, said, he has a quote about the truth, and this is it. It is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It is better to speak truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. It is better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with a multitude. It is better to ultimately succeed with the truth than to temporarily succeed with a lie. Amen? Amen. I mean, I, I tell you what grips my heart as I read that statement is the fact that there is falsehood out there that comforts and then kills. And listen, if it kills, one day, guess what it's going to do? It's going to kill for all eternity because there is a second death that does not end. It doesn't end with the grave. And so if you buy into the lies of the devil or into the deception of the world, then you may likewise perish apart from Jesus Christ. But listen, if the truth be declared to you this morning and you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you are free indeed, the Bible says. You are free. The truth is not always popular, folks. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 16, Paul asks the question, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? I've told you the truth, and, and yet am I your enemy because I tell you the truth. The truth can cause division. I, I'll be honest with you. I am the pastor of Pleasant View Baptist Church because this church told me when I came that it loved the truth. And this church has allowed me for over 11 years now to preach the truth. Unhindered, unvarnished. I don't try to make you comfortable. I try to tell you exactly what God tells me. I've been only able to pastor one church in my ministry because other places I went before I came here did not want to hear the truth. I was challenged for telling the truth. And you say, well, Brother Jeff, why are you sharing this? Because listen, part of your discipleship, as I try to lead you closer to Jesus, and as I teach you to bring others closer to Jesus, is that while standing for the truth is not always easy, it is necessary in discipleship. It is necessary that we stand for the truth, that we live by the truth, that we fight for the truth. Amen. 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 This is what the Bible teaches. And so I want to tell you that's been one of the biggest challenges I've ever faced in ministry is trying to help people recognize truth from error. I don't care how good something sounds coming from a ministry. I don't care if it sounds good coming from me even in this ministry. If it is not rooted and grounded in truth, and hear me, mark my word, it is worthless. It's worthless. If it's not the truth, it's worthless. So as we jump into the Word this morning, I want to share one line from Jesus' intercessory prayer. He prayed on behalf of disciples in John 17, 17. I'm reading from the NIV. He says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. Your word is truth. If you remember back to the very first message that we preached on discipleship, we talked about the fact that there were three G's to discipleship. There was a gospel element. We've got to declare the gospel. People must hear the gospel. They need to believe the gospel. 
We, we can't disciple people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But once they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then there's a growth element. There's a time period. And listen, it's not years and years and years and people still waiting to get to the place where they can be a disciple. Listen, it's an ongoing process. And so we take some time and we help them grow in their faith. And then we say, now go. It's your turn to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your friends, your family. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Amen? Amen? And so while truth fits every one of those categories, Jesus is saying in the moment of prayer there in John 17, 17, when he says, sanctify them by the truth, your word is true. What's he saying? He's saying, set them apart. Make them like us, not like the world by the truth and through the truth. Grow them. And so I want to show you uh, some things this morning. Three things, but in two uh, two major points this morning of how we can grow as we see the need for truth in discipleship. Number one, truth is noted by Jesus as an identifying mark of a believer. If you go to verse number 31, what does it say? He said, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples Indeed. So if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And while this is not, like I told you earlier, not one of the moments where Jesus takes his disciples aside, it is a moment where Jesus is saying, if you want to carry your belief further, if you want your relationship, are you listening to me this morning? Say, well, listen. Yes. Okay, if you want to carry your, your relationship with God further than an experience that happened at the altar, further than an experience that happened somewhere yes. else, you don't have to get saved at an altar, you can get saved driving down the road, you can get saved by your bedside, you can get saved uh, in your living room, you can get saved where the Holy Spirit of God deals with your heart and you repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can get saved in a building, you can get saved outside, you can get saved under a tent. Hey, listen, God doesn't care where you get saved, He just wants you to get saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, you can God man. So, what are you saying, Brother Jay? Well, I want you to understand something this morning. It is not the moment where Jesus takes these disciples aside. It's a moment where he's saying to some folks who just believed on him, hey, if you want your life with me to be more than believed, then this is what you must do. What must you do? Continue in my word. And you continue in my word, and that will be evidence what? That you are truly my disciples. You know what? People say they're spiritual and they ignore the word of God. They're liars. Hello? You ignore the word of God. Listen, you ignore the will of God. You are not truly his disciple because if you were truly his disciple, you would continue in the word. Amen? Continue the word. And the interesting thing to me as I was studying for this sermon is there's a word there in that text, and it's the word continue. Let me tell you something about that word continue. It is the same word that Jesus uses to say to people in John 15 and verse number 5. So if you're taking notes, you'll need to write it down. If you've got the app, you'll be able to see the note here. But John 15, 5, Jesus says, abide in me. Okay? John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now you say, Brother Jeff, how is that connected together? Because you're saying that interests you. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, I want you to understand, it's the same word. So the word to continue to abide that's found in the two separate passages, same word, okay? And so then if you back up to John 15, 3, what did Jesus say to them right before he tells them, abide in me? He says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Listen, let me tell you something. You can't come in contact with the word of God and stay like you are. If you do, listen, you are not his disciple because what happens when you belong to Jesus and you come in contact with the word of God, the spirit of God says to you, you cannot go on like that. You must change. You must shift. You must be different. You must follow Jesus. Amen. You're clean through the Word of God. What are you saying, Brother Jack? Truth transforms lives. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Truth transforms 
lives. If they were transformed by the truth and they chose to continue in the truth, then we can assure ourselves that if we are abiding in truth and we are abiding in Christ, and there will be fruit from our lives. These Jews or anyone else that comes to Christ, first here's the truth. Before anything happens to someone in respect to salvation, they hear the truth. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the Word of God is truth. And we hear truth. And when we're confronted with truth, we must decide. Listen, this morning, the truth is, is that we are all sinners. But, but God. But God, who's rich in mercy and love, with the great love, wherever it is, loved us. Do you understand what he did? He killed his son on a cross because he so loved you. And so you don't have to stay in your sins. You can hear that truth this morning that Jesus died in your place, rose from the dead, and you can be saved. So that happens for people. But get this, get this, let's take it a step further. So we first hear the truth before anything happens in respect to salvation, but then we abide in the Word, which is the truth, and that also tells us that we are abiding in Christ because He not only spoke the truth, my friends, but he is the truth because he is the word made flesh. Amen. He is the word of God. He is the truth of God. And so if we are abiding in the word, we are abiding in his teachings. And if we're abiding in his teachings, then what does the Bible tell us that we've already learned about discipleship? That when a student is mature, a pupil is full grown, mature, and they will become like their teacher. So the truth is presented to us. And the truth has been lived out before us. And now we choose to continue in the Word. And we become more like the Savior. And we begin to walk with Him. And our lives begin to reflect Him more and more. See, the importance of truth to discipleship is that from the Word, that is the truth, everything else flows Without the truth, you will not be saved. But without the truth constantly transforming your life, you will be unproductive. You understand that? Some people are stuck on the sidelines in the church house because they're not allowing the truth to transform them. And so they're unproductive in their Christian walk. And God is saying, hear my truth, respond to my truth, and be changed. Be different. Be productive. Amen? Amen. And so the evidence that the world so craves is what Jesus is speaking of in this passage. They want to see that what we say is what we do. And while some of their observations, listen, I'll, I'll give you this. Some observations of the world toward the church are in error. They don't know what they're talking about. Just like I'll give you an example. They say because we speak the truth and it condemns something that they're doing that we don't love them. No, I love them, and because I love them, I speak the truth. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Yeah. I believe that the truth will transform their lives, that they will be like they are if they hear the truth of God's Word. If they will hear it. I'm not talking about just listening, letting it go in one ear and out the other. I'm talking about taking it into their heart. If they will drink from the well of the truth, it will transform their life. Amen? And so while some of their observations may be founded on error, the ma majority of their observations probably are not. And so we are identified both to Christ as a disciple and to the world as a disciple by the fruit that is coming from our lives. So if you're not feeding the truth in, then you will not get the fruit out. You feed the truth in, and the fruit will come out the truth. Going in is like weed in a garden. Are you listening to me this morning? It's like weed in a garden. How many of y'all had weeds in your garden and it choked your crop out? You ever let that happen? Amen. It's a lot of work keeping weeds out of the garden. Isn't it? Well, I don't know. We planted a corn crop several years. And I don't know that we've got 10 ears of corn off our corn crop because we don't weed our garden like we should. And so, Brother Jeff, you ought to get up here and weed the garden. I probably should. You're right. It's as much my fault as it is anybody else's. Amen? Amen. But anyway, if you weed the garden, then guess what happens to the crops? They can be productive, can't they? Those crops can be productive. 
And the same way in your heart and life, when you allow the truth in your heart, it's like God weeding the garden. God goes in there and He says, hey, listen, that don't belong in there. Put my word in its place and remove that. He says, hey, let me see here. Uh, this needs to be cut from your life. And so he takes the word of God and he does a little surgery right there and he removes that from your heart and he puts his truth in his place. And so the truth transforming us is like weeding the garden. It removes that which does not belong. James compared the truth to being like looking into a mirror. But he warned us that we should not go away from the truth and forget what we look like because then we would be hearers and not doers. Hello? Yeah. Don't you look into the perfect law of liberty, he says, and forget what manner of man you are. No, no, no. No, he said, that, he said that's, that's what people who hear don't do. He said, you look into that perfect law of liberty and you remember, right? I mean, if you remember, it, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a matter of condemnation. Are you listening? That's not a matter of condemnation. It's a matter of transformation. So, but Jeff, how, 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 how do you get that? Uh, the best way I can compare it is some of you ladies this morning, before you came to church, you got in front of the mirror, didn't you? Boy, now some of you woke up out of the bed, and you walked into the bathroom, <coughs> and you looked over at the mirror in the bathroom, and you know you about jumped out of your skin. <laughs> Anybody ever wonders why I keep my hair short? It's because if it was long, it would be going every which direction. And I'd probably break every mirror in the house trying to get the ugly guy that's looking back at me. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure y'all are still alive. Y'all can laugh. It's okay. I know I'm being really serious this morning, but it's okay to laugh. And, and so, you know, but, but you ladies this morning, you, you looked in that mirror, and you said, okay, well, it's okay. I ain't got my shower yet. You know, whatever. I ain't got dressed yet. It's okay. You didn't forget what you looked like, though, did you? Because you didn't just jump in the shower and, 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 and put your clothes on for Sunday church and come down to a place of view and not, not, not look at your makeup and, and not fix your hair and, and, and all that good stuff. No, you took time in front of the mirror. You brushed your hair. Some of you put on makeup. And you did all that. Why? Because you saw what you looked like and you were determined to do something about it. And guess what? A transformation occurred from when you woke up that morning until you're sitting here in this church today. Hey, why in the world, listen to me this morning, James is saying, why in the world would we look into the Word of God? Why would we look into the mirror of the truth and come, come away unkempt? Not, not determined to do something about what we look like when we look into the truth. See, as we're discipling folks, we're not trying to condemn folks. We're, we're, we're trying to lovingly show them the right way to go. And we're saying, hey, hey, listen, I, I, it's not what I say about your life. It's what God's already said about your life. But he's not just said it about your life. He said it about my life. And so let's, let's together, let's look into the mirror of God's word and let him transform us. Right? Amen. Not just transform me. Not just transform you. But transform us. Because that's what this is about. So, so, so what are you saying? Jesus' challenge to those Jews who just believed was to not leave that moment unchanged. There was more to the Christian walk than believing on Him. And the real evidence of faith was not the initial experience which we so often parade around. Oh, I know I know Jesus because of. I know I know Jesus because that one time, back years ago, I prayed this prayer. And I remember who the preacher was. And I remember who was singing. Listen, folks. What has happened since the experience? Too many churches today focus on the experience. And it is not a one-time singular thing that God wants to do in your life. Yes, salvation is. But He wants to work in your life till the day you die. Amen. It is a constant abiding in Him. It is a continuous flow of His truth into our lives and it transforms us to where we don't just hear the Word, but we live it in word and in deed. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Y'all aren't listening fast enough. Come on, pick it up a little bit. Verse number 32. Look at what it said. It said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So notice, the second thing I want you to notice, I got two sub points, and we're through. Notice the importance of the truth within the discipleship process. There are two points that Christ makes right here. Number one, you know the truth from the continual abiding in the Word. What he says there is, he says, you shall know the truth. Well, how do you know the truth? What did he say right before that? If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you say, Brother Jeff, how do you know that those two thoughts are connected? Because I went to school, and in English class, my teacher did a good job. There's a semicolon and not a period. Hello? Sorry. Teachers, help me out. I just gave an English lesson right here from the pulpit. Help me out. Praise God. Okay. There's a semicolon. What do you, what do you mean, Brother Jeff? They're connected. They didn't, God didn't put a period. Don't you put a period where God has said something else. Right. Right. That'll preach. I can preach a whole sermon on that. But anyways, you'll know the truth. He said, from this continual abiding in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. Now listen, the word know is to absolutely know. You got people in this world that are like, I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just wondering. I just hope. I just think. I just, I just pray. There are some things, folks, that I absolutely, unequivocally, I know. You know why? Because they are written in the Word of God. Amen. And I absolutely know them. Strong's defines the word no as understanding, being sure of, and that you can speak. We, we had a BBS. I, this just came to my mind. I was sitting there writing these notes down, and God just brought this to my mind. I had to go back and look and see when we did it. But I knew we did it here, and I just couldn't remember how long ago we did it. But it had to have been about 10 years ago based on what I was seeing as I researched this. But there was about 10 years ago, there was a motto in BBS, and it's never left, left me, and it's this. Know the truth, speak the truth, live the truth. Back over that one? Yeah. Know the truth, speak the truth, look the truth. So, so it was Outrigger Island, that's all I know, okay? Outrigger Island, big old Hawaiian theme, party! <laughs> what them Baptists doing down there at that church? Know the truth, speak the truth, live the truth. You know what the verse was with that? At least this is good. Psalms 86 11. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, but, but just listen. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. The psalmist didn't want to have a divided heart. The psalmist wanted to have a united heart that followed after God. And he said, in order to do that, God, what I need you to help me with is I need you to teach me your way, O oh Lord, and I will walk in your truth. <coughs> my, my point is, is if we are to reach the place where we are armed with the truth in that way, we will have to spend time in it and allow God to bring forth the truth to our heart and mind. Think about this. Will you need to be armed with truth as you disciple someone in the faith? Absolutely. You know what some of you are afraid of about the discipleship process? Brother Jeff, what if I don't have all the answers? I'm just scared. I, 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 would, I would mentor somebody, but I'm afraid I won't have all the answers. you got to man. Right. Read. Yep. Hide it in your heart. Love it. And God will bring the truth to your heart and mind. I promise. Right. It doesn't happen because I'm a preacher, folks, that folks start talking about things. And I, and, I, and I say, oh, wait a minute, there's something in the Bible about that. And my brain starts working and my heart starts turning and I want to go, oh, what, what, how does it say that? Where is that at? And I want to go look it up. I want to find it so I can give that to that person because what they're saying at that moment, I know that God wants to use that to transform their life. Right, right. And it's not because I'm a preacher. It's because God is at work, not just in me. I know other people who God does this for them too. It's because they've handled the Word of God enough that they know it. I don't know it as good as some other people. But listen, I know it enough that I can help someone. And when someone says something, I can go 
search God's word and help them. Are you with me? You've got to be ready with the truth. And you've got to be ready. Just think of a few things we've learned so far. I want to show you how this marries up to the truth. Foundational questions have to be asked. And when someone has the wrong information as it relates to Christ, because they've been getting it from a person instead of the Word, you have to have more than a thimble full of knowledge of the Word of God to speak truth where there's been error. Sure, sure. What about when the enemy attacks? Remember we talked about the enemy factor? Well, if you go back and look, and, and those of you who were with me on Wednesday night, you heard a piece of this, and we're going to talk more about it this Wednesday night because we're talking about how the devil's a roaring lion. But listen, the, the devil attacked Jesus, didn't he? <laughs> And do you know that Jesus' arsenal of weapons on the enemy's attack during the wilderness temptation was the word of God. It was true. Right. The devil lies. He speaks truth. The devil twists the word of God and tries to pervert the word of God. He speaks truth. He continues. Every time that the devil says something, he gives him the word of God. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What about fleshly attitudes? How are you going to divide flesh from spirit without the word? How are you going to be able to say you need to look at this in a different way? Truth does that. Here is the truth. The truth is sharper. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Right? Sharper. It divides. What? Soul and spirit, joint and marrow. I mean, it, it, it can cut. It can get in there where it needs to get, and it can transform a life. But listen, when you have someone who is going in a fleshly direction, you have to be able to jump up there with the Word of God and say, look at this. Listen, this is what the truth says. You can argue with me, but will you wrestle with God? Hello? You can argue with me. But will you wrestle with God? The truth is that sometimes people will. But listen, we have been assured that we have sown the seed when we speak the truth. And while a person may not immediately change, they have now been confronted with the absolute truth and they have the opportunity to be transformed. I preach the truth so boldly because of that and because of what Jesus notes secondly in this text. Number two, the second thing he says in verse 32 is what? He says, and the truth shall make you free. There is freedom in the truth. Now, Jesus goes on to say after that statement of truth bringing freedom, he says this in verse 34 of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Look, look what he says here. Verse number 34. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Listen, you are enslaved to sin if you are committing sin. You say, so Brother Jeff, uh, are you saying that if we are saved, we'll never sin? No, I'm not saying any such sort of thing. What I'm saying is that anything that captures you outside, listen to this statement, anything that captures you outside of God's will is holding, your, holding you back in your process of becoming the disciple that God wants you to be. Anything that captures you outside the will of God. You say, but Jeff, you just said that if you're committing sin. Listen, anything outside the will of God is sin. I can get Zach up here right now and make him quote it. I can make him quote his little verse he's working on in James 4, 17. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sure. To get outside the will of God. You know the will of God? You get outside the will of God? If anything captures you outside the will of God, listen. That is something that you are enslaved to and it is hindering you from becoming the disciple God wants you to. You're supposed to be becoming more like Christ in the process. And if you are going back, listen to this, if you're going back to an empty well of sin, and most likely for everyone here that have some besetting sin they're struggling with, you've got one you default to. But listen, if you are continually, as you're going through this process of discipleship, you're going back to the same old empty well of sin, then that has become a stronghold in your life. A stronghold. 
The word stronghold means fortress. It has become a fortress in your life. And the Bible says that Jesus said, the truth can free you. What do you mean by that, Brother Jeff? I mean that the truth of God's Word can purchase you from your slave master and put another ruler over you. It can put King Jesus over you. God had the Apostle Paul write this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4. And I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Whatever is binding you, the truth can free you from it. Truth is essential in discipleship because some folks are on their way to being more like Christ, but they are lacking some freedom. They're caught up in some sin. They're hung up in some ungodly habit. They're, 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 they're dealing with some issue. Maybe the devil has lied to them or deceived them and told them they're not able to do what God's asking of them, and they need some freedom. And the Word of God says that God's Word can purchase you from that slave master and set you free. And they may feel trapped, but if we give them the truth, then they can be free. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to ask you to do something. Bow your heads and close your eyes.